Welcome to Autism Insights. I'm Bill Locke, your host, father of a 29-year-old with autism and a volunteer with Autism Calgary. Having repetitive behaviors, and they may have associated problems like OCD, ADHD, anxiety in a way. episode of Autism Insights, we start off with Lennon Parak, an Executive Director of Autism Calgary. Let's say that you're meeting with a social worker, and that social worker really knows nothing about the needs and the um, d- diversity uh, and the sort of the breadth of strengths and weaknesses about people with autism and their families. Why don't you pretend I am uh, that social worker and you're filling me in, okay? And are you a social worker working with children or seniors? Or? Let's say we're working with adults and in particular, uh, older adults. Well, I think people have to let go a lot of their preconceived impressions about autism and really begin to inv- investigate the individual person that they're meeting with. Kind of get to know them at, at a personal level at best or at first, Um, because I think there are so many generalizations and stereotypes that we all make about autism that we kind of forget to look at the person. I think when you start with the person and then begin to understand some some of the uh, kind of unusual differences you see in terms of autism, then I think you're getting a better lens of autism. You've got to start with the person. Okay, so... What are some myths uh, or misconceptions that people have about or stereotypes that people have about autism that are kind of skewed? Well, I I think there's still a lot of impressions that people with autism may be insensitive or lack sort of an understanding of other people's feelings. If I think about my son in at many times, I think he actually understands my feelings better than I understand my own. You know, I, I'll come home from work having had a really, you know, a bad day, but I'll put on a front with my son and, you know, an hour into the evening, I'm thinking, you know, what, what's up with him? You know, I'm being calm. I'm doing all the, all the right things and following all the behavioral strategies. And I only have to remember that I had a really crappy day and I can't mask it from him. So there's an emotional intelligence there that people th- usually think is not there. Absolutely. Okay. What about, uh, say, intelligence? There are some misconceptions that people have about the sort of the abilities of people with autism. Well, I think setting aside the fact that there is some research showing that intelligence tests actually begin to fail with the people that don't fit the sort of norm that they're measured to uh, give a standard comparison to. People on the periphery, like people with autism, that don't kind of respond to those kinds of measuring techniques. We're giving scores that are artificial. I think I think comes with that is a lot of assumptions that we have that people aren't intelligent. But what we're forgetting is that they actually just think differently and look at the world differently. Um, I also think we tend to, as human beings, look at people that are that different and think of them more childlike. And we're forgetting that they also have a lifelong lived experience that's quite unique and probably quite remarkable. They can't necessarily share it the way we expect them to, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of learned experience, a lot of education behind them. So would you agree that there are people as intelligent, as emotionally intelligent as anyone else who are in the autism population? Well, as I said, the emotional intelligence is there, which people think is completely absent, absent. And the intellectual intelligence is also just measured by a different learned lived experience. So I think 
they're generally quite bright people. Um, people that are higher functioning measure quite intellectually high with sort of high, incredible gifted skills and talents in certain splintered areas. Autism is a worldwide challenge. What are other countries doing to address issues faced by their citizens in the autism spectrum? What we found out is that Wales it seems to be the first region that has actually got a specific mandate. So 212, they launched the All Wales Diagnostic and Counseling Network for adults with autism spectrum disorder, uh, a new diagnosis and support service for adults to promote early intervention and timely support. So each of the 220, the 22 local Welsh communities has a lead um, autism spectrum disorder officer and an ASD stakeholder group to be with autism and family members and charities. For the first time in Wales, we're approaching a genuine multi-assessment process for adults with autism, a groundbreaking approach within the UK. And I just want you to unpack for us non-professionals what that means to have this sort of multi-assessment process. What does that look like? Right. So in other words, rather than simply go to one doctor who may not know very much about autism, the idea is to have a complete structure, identify everybody with ASD and do an assessment. So uh, see a family doctor. Do they have a cardiac problem? See uh, a cardiac physician who is uh, sort of familiar with people with ASD and how to relate to them. There may be a physiotherapy problem for joint disorders. There may be an anxiety problem, then a psychologist. You don't want to drown these people in too many professionals, a very select group who are used to working with them. And we all know that we all work best with people who we build a relationship over time, a time of trust. So when the person walks in, you say, oh, hi, John, I'm glad to see you. That is so meaningful to patients that the person recognizes them values them, is glad to see them, and really enjoys talking with them. And then they get right down to work. That's what happens. Just immediately, you've got a working relationship. It works very well. So that's what we're after in this kind of process. Thank you so much. For clarifying. Everybody lost. Everybody found. Everybody has a home. And what about your uh, influences? For me, I remember my physics teacher of all people in high school inspired me. Did you have anyone in, in your schooling who had an influence on you? I, I think each of the teachers in different ways. In elementary school, we had junior high then, and uh, which I think is a middle school now, and then high school. And they, they all brought their personalities to bear. So you had a real circle of friends uh, that were older than you, that were inspiring you. As I look back on it, I see the four friends that I think we need in our community, which is the prophet that says, you know, where are you going? Nobody likes prophets. Henry Thoreau once said, if you see someone coming to do good for you, run for your life, you know. But but there was those figures. Then there was the cheerleaders who were sympathetic and really reflected the loving face of God, if you were to look at it religiously. Uh, and then there was the harasser, because you always ran the danger of taking yourself too seriously, particularly in adolescence. And, uh, and they would burst your bubble, you know. And then the final friend is the inspirational friend that calls you to be all that you can be without embarrassing you that you are where you are. So without knowing it at the time, um, I was really following the Cameroonian proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together.
Thank you for joining us for another episode of Autism Insights. We have some exciting segments planned for future episodes, interviews with some new guests and some special features you won't want to miss. So stay tuned, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. I'm Bill Locke. Thank you.